Good morning. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, I would like to welcome you to this very important session today on Solutions Day, which is hosted by the Government of Germany and the International Resource Panel, entitled Beyond Decarbonization, Tackling the Triple Planetary Crisis Through Systemic Resource Efficiency and Circular Economy. <laughs> My name is Giovanna Valverde. I'm the ambassador of Costa Rica in Kenya and also the permanent representative to UNEP and to UN Habitat. And my third hat is as co-chair of the 10-year framework program for sustainable consumption and production, which is quite a mouthful, uh, also known as 10YFP. So it's an honor to be here and uh, be moderating this very important and unique session. I would like to begin by stating that, as we all know, UNEP's emissions gap report affirmed that there is a significant implementation gap in the Paris Agreement. This is taken into account all of the undergoing NDCs from all, all of our countries. In order to fill that gap, it is vital that although decarbonization is key to green gas house mitigation, we must look beyond decarbonization and include dematerialization through resource efficiency and circularity into our core climate strategies and NDCs. We also need to address the root cause of the climate, biodiversity and pollution crisis, namely unsustainable consumption and production patterns in our global economies. Dematerialization means finding innovative solutions that change the way we deliver on the Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement without depleting the Earth. We have to look at the big picture. Consider impacts along the full life cycle of products and services when we look at consumption and production patterns. In order to achieve our objectives, we must work collectively towards the systemic transformations needed. And that is why this session is so important. It is so exciting to be here and for the first time ever have three high-level UN uh, science policy panelists from the three different um, intergovernmental um, um, science policy groups because this has never happened before. So what we have here today, and it's an honor to have them with us, is the rep two representatives from the IPCC, one representative from IPBES, and one representative, two representatives from the IRP. For those of you who are not familiar, you should be, but in case you are not, <laughs> so the IRP is the International Resource Panel and it's under the umbrella of, of UNEP and uh, 10 YFP One Planet Network. Then we have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, which has been very important over the past three decades, in particular for policy making. And we have the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Environmental Services, IPBES. So, as I mentioned, this particular session is extremely important because for the first time ever we have high-level scientists here with us today sharing uh, uh, the approach and the conversation on the importance of resource management and the focus of circular economy in order to uh, continue with what we need to tackle the triple planetary crisis. So with this, I have the honor and I'm very pleased to invite uh, Her Excellency Minister Steffi Lemke, a German from the, the Minister from the German Ministry of the Environment, Nature Conservation, Nuclear Safety and Consumer Protection to frame this important event that we're hosting with her opening keynote. Please. Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to here in a German pavilion, and of course, greetings of uh, all to all of you joining us online as well. The Egyptian COP presidency 
has declared today Solutions Day. And this is a good decision. This is a very fitting for our topic. We will be talking about how responsible management of our planet's resources can help solve the triple environmental crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. It is very important to me, especially in, my, in times of multiple crisis, crises, that we do not lose sight of good ideas. Part of all solutions is recognizing the problem and its causes. You know that we, the international community, are facing extensional challenges. This impending collapses of the climate system, unprecedented species extinction and pollution almost everywhere on the planet, from the deep sea floor to the Arctic ice. Microplastics and chemicals are even accumulating in our own bodies. Up to now, efforts to combat these crises have paid too little attention to how we managed our resources. <coughs> the International Resource Panels, Panel has calculated that at least half of all global greenhouse gas emissions and around 90% of biodiversity loss and water scarcity can be attributed to the extraction and processing of resources. This means that from the very beginning of their life cycle, every product, all products and infrastructure systems that we use have major environmental impacts. Therefore, unless we fundamentally change how we managed finite resources and how we consume produ and produce, we will not be able to achieve our climate targets, prevent biodiversity loss, or stop the pollution of our planet. At the same time, good products, infrastructure, and services can ensure we have enjoyable, healthy lives. They make prosperity and economic growth possible. So the question we need to ask is, how can we achieve them while still keeping resource consumption to a minimum? Key instruments here are, first, efficient use of resources, and second, circular economy. Resource efficient circular economy is about sourcing, resourcing sustainably, using them efficiently and keeping them in the economic cycle for as long as possible. Nature can serve as our guide here because nature products no waste. Nature produces no waste. This starts with product design. Today's products must not become tomorrow's trash. Products that are no longer useful should serve first and foremost as a source of raw materials for new products. Our goal should be an absolute reduction in resource consumption. If fewer primary resources are needed and raw materials can be kept in the cycle, circular economy will also help make our economics resilient to crisis, crises. In some areas, this calls for systemic solutions. I will give you three examples. First, local public transport. A well-functioning local public transport system plays a vital role in resource conservation, enhances quality of life, and mitigates climate change. Extended, second, extended producer responsibility. This means that manufacturers can be obligated to take their end-of-life products back for repurposing or recycling. 
This principle has also been successful applied, successfully applied in Germany. Third, rental and repair services. Circular economy facilitates a range of sustainable business models. For instance, companies can rent out products instead of selling them or offer repair services. This necessary transition to a resource efficient circular economy cannot be accomplished at national level only. That is why Germany's G7 presidency this year focused on resource conservation and circular economy. In May, we jointly adopted the Berlin Roadmap, laying a path to greater circularity over the coming years. We are very keen on cooperation beyond the G7 countries as well, because resource streams cover the entire planet. I am therefore delighted that my colleague Francisco Canal, the Deputy Environment Minister of Colombia, will also be speaking to you shortly. None of this work would be possible without a sound scientific basis. So I'm very pleased that the three leading United Nations science panels have joined us here in the German pavilion today. The International Resource Panel, represented by Isabella Tijera, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, represented by Professor Skia, and the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, represented by Professor Josef Settele. Ambassador Giovanna Stark, with her in-depth expertise in this field, will moderate our discussion. Thank you all very much for contributing to our side event. I hope that we can lay the groundwork for lasting mutual exchange on this vital topic. On the note, I will hand over to Mr. Canal. I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Muy buenos tardes a todos y a todas. A very good afternoon to all of you. And especially a warm greeting to the minister, to the German minister. I express my thanks to the Federal Ministry of Environment and to the International Resource Panel of the United Nations Environment Program for the invitation to this high-level side event. Also, I would like to thank the Costa Rican ambassador to Kenya, Giova Valverde, for moderating the panel and, of course, to the expert scientists who are with us today. I would also like to highlight the close collaboration between Germany and Colombia in relation to the environmental challenges we face, especially in biodiversity, climate change, deforestation and circular economy. However, I would like to take this opportunity to propose a mental exercise. Imagine that tomorrow you wake up working for the Ministry of Environment of a developing country such as Colombia. As you awaken from your astonishment and practice your Spanish, you learn that 100% of the country's regions are vulnerable to climate change. Soon after, an advisor informs you that the country's main energy sources are located in areas with a high probability of drought, and despite having an energy mix that is over 70% clean, it is a country that is overly dependent on oil and coal revenues. 
When you take a deep breath, you ask your advisors what actions the country has taken to prevent these situations and, above all, to mitigate its emissions. First, you are informed that Colombia has the highest climate ambition in Latin America, with a commitment to reduce its emissions by 51 percent by 2030. Then you're given the good news that there are different political plans and roadmaps, especially a climate action law that gives weight to these goals and a national circular economy strategy that is pioneer in the region. However, the real challenge is the implementation of this feat called NDC and the implementation of the sustainable vision called circular economy, since they imply a change of approach towards the continuous polarization of resources, the reduction of the water and carbon footprint, or a more responsible use of ecosystems. This is where the need for good managers in the institutions comes in with experienced and dedicated executors. Because you need people who can put speeches into practice, who are there from 8 in the morning to 8 at night, designing the necessary programs and projects, and even more, who have the necessary capacity to bring the best international experience to Colombia. From the offices of the Colombian Ministry of Environment, you will hear about the more than 196 measures of the nationally determined contribution for 18 sectors, 13 subnational states, 5 cities and 7 companies. You will discuss for months on carbon budgets and negotiate long nights with each ministry that wants to avoid its commitments on climate action. You will also review to exhaustion the different resolutions that will be translated into the 267 environmental management plans for paper packaging waste that group together 2,138 producers at the national level. Well, dear ladies and gentlemen, it is in those scenarios, in those nights and dates, where the difference is really made, where climate action and the circular economy take shape. And that is precisely the technical support that Colombia requires as it moves towards decarbonization. I invite you to help Colombia, a country that has been overly dependent on oil and coal, to become a global power of life, in which the circular economy and the dedication of its best managers will lead us to the promised decarbonization. I invite you to generate capacities. Capacities are also part of the circular economy. I know that tomorrow you will wake up wishing to work for that sustainable future to make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, to Minister Lemke for her keynote speech and also to Vice Minister Canal. Now, um, I would like to share some thoughts as far as this discussion from the perspective of um, the 10 YFP. And as co-chair of the board, I would like to share with you that 10 YFP and the International Resource Panel was created uh, back in 2012. And what is important is that there is a mandate now to extend the 10 YFP and the One Planet Network for another uh, seven years. And two months ago, it was finally approved uh, by all the member states of, of UN, the new global strategy for sustainable consumption and production. And this is important because uh, since we are here to talk about solution in, in, the, in the day of Solutions Day, we are here to talk about how can we move forward from this perspective of sustainable consumption and production. And this global strategy, which I invite you all 
to go have a look on the website and see what it's really all about is an important blueprint for all of us in order to be able to implement this gap. The strategy aims to contribute to the achievement of the MEAs, the Multilateral Environmental Agreements, that are on climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. In order to accelerate the shift that we need for sustainable consumption and production and circularity in all countries to contribute to social and economic transformation based on a just transition according to needs and priorities. And this is particularly relevant under this strategy uh, of the UNEP-10YFP Secretariat, UNFCCC and UNDP which are supporting countries in integrating circular economy into their NDCs. Now this is for you, Vice Minister, so you can follow uh, Canal 2. So what is important now is the wonderful participants that we have here with us today who will help us understand this complex situation, but with some solutions as well. And with that, I would like to introduce um, these keynote speakers or panelists, which will help share with us the critical role of science, knowledge, and data to inform our decisions. So with that, I would like to welcome our dear Isabela Teixeira, co-chair of the International Resource Panel, IRP, Please join us. Yes, she's a former Minister of the Environment of Brazil. Please. Then we have Professor Setele, who is the co-chair of the Global Assessment Report of Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES, who will be um, with us online. Then we have Professor Jim Skea, who's here in person with us, and who is the co-chair of the Working Group 3 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. Please. Yeah. He is also chair of the Scotland's Just Transition Commission and was a founding member of the UK's Committee on Climate Change. Mm -hmm. We also have Mr. Janis Potochnik, who's the co-chair also of International Resource Panel and former European Commissioner for the Environment. And he is connected online. Yeah. Hello. And finally, we have, who else do we have? We have everybody. Yes. And you. And myself. <laughs> so here we are. So thank you very much to all of our five uh, panelists. I want to start this uh, conversation uh, asking you a question and to get your input. And I would like to kind of limit it to five minutes maximum per, per panelist. As we know, earlier this year, the G7 adopted a com comprehensive communique and the Berlin Roadmap on Resource Efficiency and Circular Economy. In these documents, the G7 members stated that the transition away from linear and wasteful economic systems towards more efficient and circular ones was absolutely mandatory if we wanted to achieve uh, the climate change and biodiversity goals as, where, as well as the fight against uh, pollution. However, many international observers say the considerable environmental and climate footprint of global resource use consumption is not adequately reflected in current policy responses to the planetary crisis. So I would very much appreciate it if you could all, uh, thinking from your own institution or your research institutions, how do you assess the role of current resource use patterns for the planetary uh, crisis? So perhaps we can begin with you, Isabella, yes, from thank IRP. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, let's see how I can summarize this. It's so important, but it's absolutely ignored. This is my first point here. I mentioned this earlier that uh, how also the business leader in the world 
They don't know, don't, don't know about the data, the importance of natural resource use in the planet. As the minister mentioned, it's related to 50% of greenhouse emissions. It's related to 90% of water stress and water scarcity and biodiversity loss. One third of the pollution and consider health issues. So what it means, people don't know how to connect the dots. Okay, and uh, data have our as leader scientists of so Global Resource Outlook here, and the, how hard it is to co connect the dots. We have the data, we have the science knowledge, but we need to move in different directions. And this, we need to access uh, to make sure how unjust and unsustainable the resource use in the world is. And uh, also, uh, some, some use too much and uh, some not enough. This is so environmental resource inequalities. So it's used to say about in social inequality, but we need to observe environmental inequality in the world. And I can say this based on my country, that we really have powerful, we're so powerful natural resource, but our society doesn't understand how natural resource use is so strategically to tackle not only climate change, but to be a fair and inclusive development. What I'm discussing is development. We need new metrics to understand the new dynamics of economic growth, we have this reform of uh, Branton Woods next week. The natural resource next year, natural resource is absolutely critical to connect things because all these planetary crisis solutions and finance will overlap with development finance. So it's very important to understand how it should come with um, the most urgent and how action need now. You need to use natural resource and to understand the natural resource efficient because this will double by 2006. This is our scenarios, so or scientific scenarios. You don't have natural resources to attend the demands of the population, the gross populations uh, that you have in the world. So I think that uh, we need, this is really an opportunity for prosperity with planetary boundaries. If you understand the role of natural resource, not to only consider circular economy, but how it should connect the dots and bring out uh, the, the innovative way to north and south cooperation. We need to bring this in other pathways. We need to understand what leadership means and how scientists will come to play a strategic role together with policymakers and business leaders and civil society. So I used to say, to end my comments, that resource is something that people can say, can see. It's not the carbon. You know carbon? I never met carbon. I know that it exists, but uh, I never, it's not touchable. But water, soil, minerals, everything, you can see this. And I'm, based on my political experience, we need to ground things. We need to land things to make sure that people could manage and have choice, even consider consumers, to have choice to take the right decision and to be transformative players and not to only reactive players. And this is what resource can mean for us. We can be transformative. We can give choice for people to do the right direction, to, to, do, to have the right, the right uh, options. As you mentioned, it's sustainable consumption and how we go into the supply chains with natural resources. So connect the dots in innovative ways and make sure that we can bring solutions and we can come with international cooperation with strategic role to bring people together into solidarity as we are here. A model this with short action now. 1.2 means how we can, how we can address short-term actions now. And this is for me a priority if you want to change, if you want to be better in the future. It's not, there is no time to buy, it's only to postpone, no. So I think that the resource plan is coming, how our scientific knowledge will come into the, our lives to make sure that you can have, you have options and you must take action now. Never give up of our responsibility, what science used to say to us. And I'm convinced that we can come with innovative arrangements because business leaders and, pri and also uh, uh, governments and also civil society, philanthropy, everyone that wants to be engaged to act now. So please don't postpone, use natural resources, so don't postpone the agenda and make sure that we, International Resource Panel, we are coming to support and make sure that we have not only the global data but regional ones and national ones. This will allow people to be engaged and to take decisions in the right direction. Back to you. Thank you very much, Isabella. Thank you very much. And now I would like to ask uh, Professor Skea if you could also please give us your insight. 
Yeah, okay, it was a pleasure this time in this cycle that there was an awful lot more attention given to materials efficiency and the circular economy in the IPCC Working Group 3 report on mitigation. And I'll, I'll actually be quite specific about how it was treated. It was at, the emphasis was in two chapters, one on industry and the other one on demand, services and social aspects of mitigation, which was a very novel chapter for Working Group 3, because we talked about people for the first time, you know, what, what, a, what, a, what a good innovation. It was very clear which chapter was written by engineers and which one was written by social scientists, and our social scientist friends found 114 definitions of the circular economy, which I will, I promise you, not to go through <laughs> but let me take the industrial kind of conclusions first which are more technical and then I'll say just a few words about the wider social aspects so the industry chapter focused it on two themes one on materials efficiency and the other on circular economy which are very related and on materials efficiency to, since it's solutions day I'll do the kind of solutions they came up with designing products which are lighter and use less materials, designing for circular principles, i.e. longer life, reusability, repairability, and ease of recycling, pushing manufacturing and fabrication process to use materials and energy more efficiently and recover material wastes, increasing the capacity, intensity of use and lifetimes of products and use, and improving the recovery of materials at end of life through remanufacturing, reuse and recycling. So some very specific solutions that came up there. They then moved along to look at the circular economy more specifically and looked at three different kinds of levels, the micro, the meso and the macro. And at the micro level, it was very practical things, cleaner production, eco-design, environmental labelling, process synthesis and green procurement. At the middle level, it was things like having industrial parks and symbiosis where industries could be co-located and pass materials one from the other. And at the, finally, at the market le macro level, they were thinking about urban symbiosis, uh, thinking about how industry and production was wrapped into wider urban systems and the treatment of water and waste. So they came up with a, actually a, a quite a wide range of very specific uh, solutions there. And their conclusion was that by 2030, these kind of approaches could lead to a six gigaton of carbon dioxide equivalent emission reduction by 2030. So they put some quantification on that. So uh, uh, currently the gap between present policies and a 1.5 pathway is probably about 30 gigatons of CO2. So that's six gigatons. It won't solve all the problems, but it's a very important step in terms of, of going in the, in the right direction. Now just, just to, to address the wider, wider social, social perspectives in that new people chapter, I think the circular economy approaches were also set aside and closely integrated with other approaches, including the sharing economy, for example, and when we have car clubs or car sharing schemes, the evidence that every car in these drives another five or six cars off the road as people give up private ownership. And they also picked up on the idea of sufficiency, which was also in our buildings chapter. How much stuff do people really need? Many square meters of space do they need to, for their well-being and to lead a high quality of life? So I do think that there is a very big agenda that we need to take further, I think, in IPCC and further reports. And uh, you may get onto this, but you know, how could IRP and IPCC collaborate with each other, I think, is a very important question. I have some ideas on that. I, I hope I get a chance to put them in. <laughs> I hope so, too. I hope so, too. Uh, Professor, thank you so much for that very interesting intervention. And now I would like to invite Professor Setele from IPBS, who is our co-chair of the Global Assessment Report. Please. Thank you very much for having me there. I hope you can understand me, yes. if that's okay. Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. 
so I'm really delighted to be invited and to represent IPES in this meeting, as I'm just the co-chair of Global Assessment, but not representing IPES formally, but I try my best to be to do justice to this to this task. So one important component I would like to bring in is the link between the three crises, which we also had in the Global Assessment, uh, where it dealt with the drivers of biodiversity change. And there it was climate change and pollution as being two of the major direct drivers affecting biodiversity globally. So there's a very direct link, or, or link already here, which we need to explore further. We do this already in the context of IPCC. There was a report last year on climate change and biodiversity, and I guess we can go further also with the inclusion of IRP. What we also looked into, of course, is the indirect drivers. I mentioned before already the social values related to this, and the solutions are all on this side, which means we have to deal with demographic change, with economic and technological aspects, with institutions and governance, etc. So the solutions are on governance, in economic systems, in equity, that's locally as well as globally. So the inequality is an important point. Cross-sectoral planning, incentives, social narratives and values have been the kind of, let's say, sets of uh, points we made there in our global report. Well, if it comes to pollution, just as take it one example, we did in the assessment on pollination some years back, 2016 was the summary of policymakers. We look, for example, on pesticides, quite an important component, very directly related to biodiversity in this case. And I guess there are many options here to get improvement. And we had some recommendations already in that stage in 2016. It's about standards of risk assessment, for example. The reduction of usage is an important component. There's still lots of space to use much less pesticides in our agricultural settings. Looking for alternative forms of pest control, for example. Training is important, so mainstreaming biodiversity, training farmers, extensionists, and also land managers. And of course, adopting technologies, which also help to reduce the impacts. This is one concrete example in this uh, from this coordination assessment, which is one part of our work. I mainly focus on more global aspects right now because it was a global assessment. But of course, the task is then to break this down to more regional conditions, which we did for the pollination one, for example, in, on the local setting for Germany, where we translated the recommendations into the national language in the socio-ecological system and setting where people can understand what we recommend. That means we jointly developed these recommendations in interacting with the farmers and the farmer advisors for a two-day internal meeting, which was a kind of very good solution in the end. Components we had in the global assessment on the summary for policymakers, as you know, these are this kind of internationally agreed consensus documents. One of them was promoting sustainable agriculture and agroecological practices in the context of feeding humanity, which is quite important. Agroecology is a discipline that also has a kind of philosophy behind. And one component here was the empowering of producers and consumers to transform supply chains and facilitate sustainable and healthy dietary choices. So this is one important component. It's very concrete. This is the single producers, but also consumers. It's quite important, this transformation here in supply chains, which has a lot to do with waste, of course, and with, with pollution. Another point which linked to the interaction between climate change and biodiversity and uh, in the context of biofuel production, we were very critical, IPES and as well as IPCC, about large-scale deployments of intensive bioenergy plantations, for example, which will likely have negative impacts on biodiversity and can threaten food and water security, as well as local livelihoods, which includes also intensifying social conflicts. So another component where we have these linkages here, which is quite important to consider. What I think is very important in general for the solutions here, and that's a quote now from our document, it was a number D10 in the summary of policymakers, a key component of sustainable pathways is the evolution of global financial and economic systems to build a global sustainable econo economy, steering away from the current limited paradigm of economic growth. This is a consensus text from the negotiations in Paris 2019. I think that's a quite important part of the, of the story. So I think this is enough right for the moment just to give some input on what we envisage. And I think it's a good idea to really to get a closer linkage between IPCC, IPES and IRP. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Sotele. And uh, now, last but not least, uh, uh, please, Mr. Janis Potocnik, who is also co-chair of the International Resource Panel. Thank you, Ambassador. Dear ministers, dear colleagues, uh, to compliment Isabella. The question you have asked already acknowledges that resource use is not adequately reflected in current responses to the triple planetary crisis. The IRP's scientific insights show us that we need to complement our current focus from focusing largely on cleaning the supply side of our material energy provision 
and improving the existing economic model to looking also at how we can reduce demand and introduce deep system change solutions. So to minimize the need for natural resources in the first place. And it is great that IPCC and IPBS, uh, as explained by Jim and Joseph, are also looking into that. Technological solutions for decarbonization are important, but need to be complemented with broader economic system innovations. We can see from IRP analysis that despite all the efforts, global material productivity has not improved in the last 20 years, mainly due to the structural shift of production from resource more efficient to resource less efficient countries. The current economic system is fo focusing on maximizing outputs of sectors and not looking at how we can best deliver functionalities, needs of humans. But it is, for example, wasted to decarbonize the production of steel, even if it's necessary and needed, if still it's still used to produce underutilized cars and houses. We just contribute to traffic and property market bubbles, but not to the real social prosperity and equity. So to effectively reduce demand, we would need to complement resource efficiency with sufficiency policies. We simply cannot continue to ignore the inherent wastefulness of our production and consumption, in particular in high-income countries, including G7. They must reduce the resource use, as underlined also by Minister Lemke. Countries which need to increase resource use to make necessary improvements to well-being can and must be supported to start building the competitive, circular, healthy socioeconomic systems of the future, as we have rightly heard from Colombia, but also their growing economies should be carefully future-proofed and sustainably managed. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that reduced resource use would worsen quality of life, rather quite the opposite. Just think of any well-managed city with satisfied and happy citizens in terms of quality of life. They all provide high levels of active mobility, compact yet balanced neighborhoods, and access to local healthy food. In other words, they deliver high quality of life through the shifts needed for saving virgin resources at scale. And where we say virgin resources, we also say embodied energy. By focusing on human needs rather than optimizing traditional sector outputs, we can unlock solutions which reduce resource use while simultaneously improve well-being. Next IRP's flagship report, Global Resource Outlook 24, will follow this system's lens logic. We propose to focus on major systems delivering resource-dependent human needs, including nutrition, the built environment, sanitation, and mobility. The science shows us necessary actions, some already in progress, to leverage resource efficiency for maximum effect. Policy making needs to address and remove the barriers, meaning correct the market signals, which are currently sending producers and consumers in the wrong direction. Invest in science, and participate in data and knowledge generation and sharing to understand where and how resources are used as a basis for informed decision making. Translate the ambitious overarching visions into concrete policies by improving governance and make it more effective. Formalize mechanisms for incorporating resource management into decision making. Most climate policies and national plans still neglect necessary resource efficiency solutions in their NDC's submissions as well as in national biodiversity plans. And finally, complement supply side with demand side solutions. This is essential also from a fairness and equity related point of view. It is always healthy to look in the mirror first. While the responsibility for the past is clear, responsibility for the future is shared and common. The German government has indeed shown great leadership on resource efficiency and circular economy with this year's G7 communique and Berlin roadmap. Need it and appreciate it. It is very encouraging to see G7 committing to leverage resource efficiency and circular economy in NDCs and national biodiversity strategies. The commitment stating, continue and deepen the exchange within G7 on methodologies and data used to develop and track progress towards relevant national and regional goals, indicators, and targets. It's a very welcome development, and in the IRP, we stand ready 
to help you delivering this in practice. To conclude, dear friends, systemic resource efficiency and circular economy are ultimately an economic, security, and resilience imperative. The best and only way to avoid or at least minimize any potential future crisis, be it related to security, to environmental sustainability, including climate and biodiversity, to social fairness and equity, to economic success, is to systematically strengthen our collective resilience. And this includes responsible resource use. Back to you, Ambassador. Janice, thank you. Very valuable, uh, concrete uh, proposals. And now I would like to move into uh, three different questions that I will pose to each one of the three different intergovernmental panels so that we can kind of see where the problem lies and what are the current challenges. So I would like to begin first with the IPCC. And Professor, the latest IPCC Working Group 3 report on mitigation centralizes on the importance of resource efficiency and circular economy as climate solutions. To meet climate targets, we have committed to tackle them as a global community. How will our resource efficiency and overall use of resources need to change from our current trends? This is, this is a very uh, big question that, that you have uh, j just, put me to, just put to me there. And I think all of the interventions we've heard from IRP, IPBES, and IPCC have indicated that you know, we need to bend the trend very considerably or even have quite radical changes if, if uh, resource efficiency is going to play its appropriate role uh, I I in the future. I wonder, since I have to go in five minutes, which I warn you, whether I could actually uh, pick, d just answer one question which I know is coming because I think it's a very important one about the way the different panels interact with each other. And just to say on that, I do think it is a very major challenge to produce joint reports between the panels because each panel has a different mandate and governments certainly in IPCC guard these, these mandates very closely and look after the procedures. But so I think we need to be clever about the baby steps, as it were, that we take to make sure that this interaction takes place. And we actually have some lessons from this IPCC cycle. In previous cycles, the three working groups have been quite siloed. This time we collaborated much, much more. And I think that gives a signal for the kind of steps that could be taken to bring the work of the panels closely together. So first of all, we produced a joint glossary. Now that might sound very boring, but it's very important that scientists use the same language. So we're talking about the same thing. And uh, there is a process going on through UNEP, the mysteriously called AGAD, the uh, Ad Hoc Global Assessment Dialogue, which is discussing a common glossary. We could look at scenarios as a way of joining up across the different assessments. So we're making different uh, assumptions and be comparable. And one thing we also did in this cycle was to have boxes which appeared in more than one, one report. So maybe you could work on things that are, you appear in an IRP report and appear in an IPCC report. So I think there are actually se just several very practical things we could move forward. And perhaps the much easier way to move forward is the example of the IPBES IPCC collaboration on the workshop on climate change and biodiversity which took place, which actually could be extended to in, in interactions between the other panels. So my apology for subverting your question a little bit, if I didn't have the chance to make that point, I would be very disappointed. No, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I know that you have to, you have to run, but in, indeed, I think one of the objectives of this uh, mm. session was precisely see how can we bring all these three yeah. intergovernmental uh, panels together yeah. moving forward to, to affront the three issues of climate change, biodiversity, loss, and uh, pollution. So thank you very much we for that. We look forward to this collaboration in the future to all, all my fellow panelists. Wonderful. Panel thank yes. you so much, <laughs> Professor. Thank you. Safe travels home, huh? So 
now I'm going to move on to the next question, which is uh, mainly uh, Janice, Mr. Potochnik, if you would, would mind uh, addressing it. And it is, when we look at the carbon footprint of resource consumption across borders and supply chains to be factored into climate decision making, how can we do this? How can we do this given that the NDCs are addressing domestic emissions? How do and how could resource policies such as improved resource efficiency and circular economy fit into the structure and scope of the NDCs? Thank you so much, Janice. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, allow me to start in a bit strange way uh, with an observation linked to the European Union. As you know, European Green Deal is without any doubt very important, almost revolutionary document, which is setting relations among economy and environment on a different, more healthy footing. Document, it's important for Europe, but uh, I think it's also important globally. In its most quoted paragraph, we can find the targets of reaching no net emissions of greenhouse gases in 2050 and where economic growth is decoupled from resource use. But it is interesting to see how much attention it's actually giving to the goal related to the no net emissions of greenhouse gases and how the second part of the commitment, economic growth to be decoupled from resource use is somehow set aside, rarely mentioned. It is only recently getting more attention, but actually again in the context of the need to reach the no net greenhouse gas emissions target due to the acknowledgement that success of energy transition depends on securing the access to increase critical raw materials. So I would like to be clear, it's not only about critical raw materials, but about all materials, all natural resources, which we must use and manage more responsibly if we want to meet the impact targets set in climate in biodiversity and pollution. And this is, of course, not important only for Europe. It's important for all the countries. So reducing resource use footprints along entire international supply chains is a key lever, especially for high income countries. And NDCs do, uh, do indeed miss outsource impact, but domestic resource efficiency can still be leveraged by NDCs and biodiversity plans. Europe and North America, for example, have much higher impact footprints for their total material consumption, then it's captured by their domestic consumption. And both are outsourcing impact to other regions. Although outsourced consumption does not fall within the scope of NDCs, ambitious countries could base their net zero plans on material footprint, which includes impacts along entire supply chains. Material footprint data are available they would probably need to be used on a disaggregated level, biomass, metals, non-metallic minerals, fossil fuels, since, you know, measurements in tons, in particular in countries still building their cities and infrastructure, would easily lead to a bit misleading conclusions. But even though NDCs do not include outsource impact, there is still potential for them to leverage resource efficiency and circular economy to a great extent. An analysis of G20 indices, long-term climate strategies, and national climate and energy plans found that there was much scope to include resource efficiency solutions. For example, looking at buildings, very few indices take the full life cycle of buildings into account. Emission reduction plans focus on energy efficiency while building it's in use, not taking opportunities to reduce emissions through building design or material choice or by improving the efficiency of overall urban design in the first place. IRP analysis shows that enhanced building material efficiency strategies have the potential to reduce building emissions in G7 by one third across building life cycles. In China and India, these strategies could reduce emissions even up to by 70%. It is similar for mobility systems. Transport strategies largely focus on electrifying personal vehicles, overlooking the significant impact of embedded resource use in their manufacture. There is a great potential to include measures incentivizing and improving the infrastructure for low emission travel options. 
The fact that these strategies do not feature more in indices, it's thus a real missed opportunity. So I sincerely hope that the tool currently under development by 10 YFP will help countries to leverage resource efficiency systematically in NDCs in line with already mentioned G7's commitment to do so. Back to you, Ambassador. So, so true. And I think uh, it would be fantastic if somehow we can transmit this uh, missed opportunity like you so clearly stated for countries to be able to look at this um, sectorial approach, for example, just the one on sustainable uh, building construction in, in the uh, NDCs. But I think we could do like a full day workshop just on that, <laughs> on that topic. But thank you very much. It's extremely important. And now I would like to ask Professor Setele from IPES in perspective. When we think of the targets for the, nat for the natural world and the flag flagship goals and targets which are often focused on conservation, for example, the currently proposed 30 by 30 target on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. How can action on production and consumption contribute to bend the curve on biodiversity loss? How can these actions be integrated into and support the post-2020 biodiversity framework? Thank you, Ambassador. So, well, let's start with the 30 times 30 idea of, of conservation of areas. Well, first of all, many people, if they talk about this, think about wilderness areas, but mostly it's, it's areas which are in, uh, populated by people, of course. In Central Europe, it's very obvious. We have cultural landscapes mainly, but also many other places of the globe have the same, let's say, uh, characteristics, even cons uh, conservation areas, nature conservation areas. So I guess uh, the first point is we have people living in these places. It's not a place which is completely, let's say, put out, uh, where people are put out. It was a very old concept in the USA, I think, historically was one of them with the national parks. So that's something we have to take into consideration. Now, if we have these uh, areas which are maintained by local communities, uh, it's also a matter of how you will run these areas. If I take the example from Central Europe, we have lots of open spaces which are managed through cattle grazing, for example, which are also managed through other means, but is a very important component. Now we have, uh, in terms of consumption, now we have the problem that in Europe, we consume much too much meat, so consumption literally as a food for, for humans, much too much uh, meat. And of course, we import most of the, many of the substance we need for this from other places, from the global south, soya, soya from South America, for example. If we would be able to change this, con con this, uh, this consumer pattern, this consumer behavior into a much less meat-based uh, context, it would be much more productive in terms of what you can produce locally. So we have less impact on the global scale. Now, coming back to the 30 times 30 thing, and of course, we need a certain component of meat production. In this case, in our setting, for example, this would also be the basis for managing this high nature value farmlands, actually, this, this high nature value areas, which have lots, lots of endangered species. So I think this is an, as a total, let's say, combination of consumption patterns, which are more local, which are more based on plants, but have some animal component, which also leads to much, much less exporting of the impacts, which we do now from the global north to the global south. And I guess the environmental impacts of Europe, I think, Janis, the dimension is around 80% of the things we are doing in a negative sense are exported to the global south, at least something in this dimension. So I guess this is a very important component where we have to include consumption, now very literally in terms of food uh, supply for people and the conservation of biodiversity. Maybe that's enough for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, and uh, very, very valid points. And I think they're also intrinsically related to the IRP and uh, from the 10 YFP, the whole concept of uh, consumer information and uh, particularly on um, carbon footprint of all the products that we all consume, wherever we may come from. I think that's very important for, for consumers. Um, and so now I would like to give the word to um, Isabella and pose a very interesting question. Um, and it's with low-income countries where we have the smallest resource consumption footprints, but are often disproportionately affected by the impacts of global and especially high-income country resource use, including climate change and environmental disasters. 
At the same time, low and especially middle income countries are in the process of building economies and infrastructures which provide their populations with access to goods, education, and the opportunity to thrive. All of that will take natural resources to build. What does that mean for global resource use across country contexts? Isabella. Uh, this is a fascinating question. For me, it is uh, natural resource politics. Uh, and uh, Yanis and I, we are really good friends as scientists, but also policymakers and political players. And it's fascinating how we came together, okay, uh, to manage this issue in the past and how we are today together, international resource planning, make sure that with the scientists, uh, data and knowledge and scientists players, together with policymakers and also business leaders, how we should manage this question. And uh, I think that we have two tracks, okay? Because when you go into the developing world, emerging and poorest countries as we manage, we need resource to promote our development. And of course, that to minimize the use of the resource is not there, okay? We need to be efficient in our use. We need to avoid waste. When we need to, for example, go into house capping and then go into cities, and how can you use better materials to manage a new ways to have house, and uh, also how you can create jobs, and how we can have this inclusive, uh, inc inclusive strategy for developing, use natural resource uh, based on result waste and more efficient. So how we can use better, but not necessarily minimize, so we need to minimize the waste, but not the use. So this is very important because means that we can bring people close to solutions. As you mentioned before, what are the choice as a consumers, as a citizen to play in the right direction? The other side of the coin is exactly what you need. So you need to, to mix, what you need to minimize is the rich countries, what you need to maximize is what how poorest countries developing world should do this better. And this means that you need to, to, to address equity. And you need to understand how we can come into the reality to address just transition or climate just transition. You come from Costa Rica, you know very well how huge our challenge is to make sure that we have need to avoid new inequalities when you have some solutions, for example. You cannot exclude people. When you go in a country like my one and from Brazil, and you need to manage social inequalities, what is the, the roots of the social inequalities? Racism. So we need to understand how we can come with the different political movements and use natural resources as an asset to make sure that you can go in the right direction. But more than this, to convince people to be committed and to convince people to act together with uh, science and bring science close to people. Because at least the solution means how we can connect people. This, if you want to play hope, people is part of hope. Okay, so I think that when we go into high-income countries, we need absolutely to reduce their resource use. When you go into the low-income low income countries, middle-income countries, we need to couple resource use with well-being. We need to couple, it's not decoupling, we need to couple, what, convince guys that you should move, uh, we are able to act in short-term perspective because nobody wants to wait more. Okay, and uh, this is very important to bring resource, uh, natural resource use as really short-term solutions. And as the honest and also IPBS and IP IPCC mentioned, we need to connect scientists. We need to go into regional scientific knowledge. We need to understand how people will keep this agenda as an asset and a political asset. So my feeling is uh, we need the global discussion on the options of sustainable management of natural resource to unlock global cooperation. And this is, we don't need, we don't have a convention on natural resource, as we have a climate regime and we have a biodiversity regime. So that's important, but this for me, the new lens of international cooperation in this century. And we need to understand when you go now in the reform of uh, United Nations system, how resource use will come to reframe the future. And I'd like to remember, I'd like to tell this story to end my answer. When I was in 92, I was there, in the last century. I was at the beginning of my career. I'm not too old, please. <laughs> uh, I remember that we have all difficult 
uh, to convince the countries to have a convention on forest. And to have a declaration. You know this, Ambassador. And how the developing countries try to have this. Today, all the debates consider solutions, nature-based solutions, and even not based solutions, everyone can see the lens to, uh, to check the importance of forest. So 30 years later, that you're not able to control our emissions and to have also the emerging economies in this century with this role, it's impressive. Everyone is now here who wants to talk about forest. But you have a chance, 30 years behind, okay, to, to frame this in the right way, to make sure that you can come with legally binding other regimes, a region that's so important for international cooperation. What I'm saying today is that now, again, we have natural resource agenda asking or claiming to come. Okay, we don't need additional 30 years to find out that we need to do this. So let's connect the right points, so the right agendas, the right dots, to make sure, use the new lens, okay, to picture the solutions framework and to make sure that not only bring together IPBS, IPCC, and IRP. We need to, people used to have the picture, took everything together. We need to decouple our data and coupling our, our solutions to make sure that, okay, let's do this and don't, don't wait anymore. So that's why I use this idea of a 1.2 Celsius degrees, because this means our CBDR, okay? This is, and for people, people, what? I want to, I, as a consumer, I want to, to buy something that in the right direction. And this is my country, for example. People want to discuss deforestation. Unfortunately, we have deforestation back, but we are going to tackle this now with the new government. But look, when you go into beef production, if you are not vegan, you want to have a barbecue and Brazilians want this, 75% of the beef production in Brazil, they are consumed by Brazilians. So my first priority as a scientist, as a political player, as a business leader, is okay, let's allow that national market can access beef without deforestation and be sure that we have transparency there. And this means that the net resource will come in supply chains and also can have consumption and production in innovative perspective. And international cooperation will come not only to support it, but to make sure that we can minimize the footprint of developed countries because developing countries, we are doing our uh, work in, well, in, in the right direction. So I think that we need to have the new lens uh, to come into the solutions. Please don't use the past uh, to the present. Bring the future to the present and take the right direction. It can be better in the future. And this is what is in my personal opinion, what natural resources use efficient means. Circularity means to bring people together, yes. But uh, let's convince the guys that they can act now and let's be together. We need solutions based on peace. Okay, you don't need to be split, fragmented. Come on, this is really something that uh, uh, it's not a, an agenda to bring the geopolitical dispute. This is an agenda to have a new geopolitics, okay, to planetary geopolitics that to allow us to come together. That's why international cooperation is so important. But I, I believe, Ambassador, that we need the new lens on international cooperation. North and South, and G7 with G20, okay, and all the like-minded alliance that we have and to have today, and also we need to convince the guy that took the, we to take a decision, like multilateral banks, etc., to come together with us, and more than this, to make sure that we are promoting development uh, with natural resource, with an asset for our development. This is clear, and based on my, my experience, we can do this uh, without setting back in, in the future. This is very important to observe. What do you need? You're too nervous. <laughs> Thank you so much, Isabella. <laughs> but unfortunately, and I'm very sad, but we have to close down because uh, Minister Lemke has to um, retire. And uh, unfortunately, we had a third part, but maybe we'll do this at some other point in time, maybe some virtual event. Um, so I would like to thank all of the participants for, for their very valuable input. I hope we can come up with a very... Um, succinct but uh, precise summary of the things, the highlights of what each one of all you five uh, brought up in this discussion. So with this, I would just like to give uh, Minister Lemke the floor for her closing remarks.
please. Yes, uh, Ambassador, uh, thank you so much for your excellent moderation of uh, this wonderful side event. Many thanks also to our panelists, to their valuable input, and to the participants um, here, here at the German Pavilion and in the live stream. Now uh, that we have enjoyed an uh, in-depth and informative 90 minutes, I think, and a very good summary from you, Ambassador, all that remains is for me to highlight my most important takeaways from this event. Firstly, it was once again made very clear today that we must absolutely give more attention to global resource consumption to deal with the planetary triple crisis. This, me this means that resource efficiency and circular economy need to be systemic, systemic telegraphy integrated international and international instruments for climate action and biodiversity, as well as pollution prevention. Secondly, we must work particularly on reducing global resource consumption. We must successfully decouple economic growth from resource consumption, otherwise our global goals will not be achievable. And thirdly, and this is uh, very key for me, this exchange between the three United Nations panels with participation from ten by FP not remain a one-off event. Germany will work within the G7 framework and beyond to ensure that these scientific findings make their way into policy making if the event at the German Cup Pavilion could lead to regular close cooperation, it would benefit the world's climate policy in the long term. Thank you so much for being here for our discussion. And the last remark what I want to make, act now. Yes. Thank you so much.